I'm John Caden. I have the privilege of being the Vice Chancellor you know, of the University and uh, delighted to welcome all of you here today. Um, you know, very much appreciate it. Um, if you'll forgive me, however, I'm even more delighted uh, to welcome someone who you know, I've known not particularly well for a number of years, although actually didn't give some indication of my age and antiquity. Uh, my own kind of doctoral research many years ago was around sort of race and immigration and migration, and uh, I actually knew Lisa's father, perhaps rather better than I know Lisa. Deepak Nandi, of course, was the you know, headed up the Running Me Trust for, you know, for, you know, for many years. So it's a real privilege to, you know, to have Lisa here today, but also actually I just want to say a word first of all about you know, what this is. The very first event actually of this year's uh, Festival of Ideas, which runs for uh, the next um, you know, two, two weeks or, or, or so. Um, and there are a range of sort of really you know, excellent sort of um, opportunities within that. Uh, some delivered actually also in partnership, you know, our partnerships with the Everyman, for example, down in Liverpool, our partnerships with the Tate. Um, there are you know, um, so some wonderful film screenings to, to be held, lots of you know, conversations. Also, actually, some people who are almost as eminent as, uh, as Lisa you know, joining us, for example, uh, Joe McGann, you know, of the, uh, the, the McGann family, who I think, uh, you know, run all sort of performance out of Liverpool virtually, it seems to me, on, a, on, you know, on occasions. <laughs> uh, we've also got, um, and this is a really rare appearance, uh, um, someone who, again, I remember from an iconic film from my very early childhood, that was A Taste of Honey, and that's uh, Rita Tushingham, who actually is here, you know, in the university, you know, on the 25th of October, and someone who, um, I think you know, has been very open about you know, the challenges of mental health. It's a substantial issue, actually, you know, for those of us who work you know, in higher education at the moment. And that's actually the work of uh, you know, quite an eminent sort of a footballer, but also perhaps particularly an eminent commentator upon the challenges of sort of depression and the like, and that's uh, Clark Carlisle. And uh, there are sort of programs around the place, and uh, I've only given you a very small taste of some of the things which actually the university is offering within that fortnight. And I would hope to see you know, very many of you actually along you know, for, you know, for those events. But today, however, what we have is you know, um, Martin and Lisa you know, are going to be you know, in conversation. I'm really, I say, you know, um, you know, someone, you are more important than the Queen's speech. I mean, to give you some indication of where this all, you know, you know, all, all sits today. Um, there is no doubt, I mean, Lisa and I were just having uh, what I hope was a private conversation, but she did have two microphones <laughs> on her at, the, uh, the, uh, at, at that particular point in time about where we are. And I think, um, I don't believe any of you know where you know, we're going to be over the next two or three weeks politically. I certainly don't know. And um, if Lisa knows, she's hiding it very well, <laughs> shall we say. So, uh, you know, we clearly are you know, in you know, cha you know, challenging times. And Lisa, as I say, known, known to us, I mean, as a very supportive member of parliament for Wigan, now for, you know, for nine years. Um, I love the fact, actually, having you know, referenced her father, um, that uh, you know, Lisa is, I think, a very, very solid and you know, much, you know, very highly regarded member of the Labour Party. I understand that your father thinks you're too right wing, though, and that's, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, which amused me, uh, you know, which, you know, which amused me somewhat. I mean, that, that isn't some, but, um, you know, Lisa served under Jeremy Corbyn as uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and for Climate Change, and also, actually, something which very much plays into this university, this location, and I know, actually, one or two colleagues in the faculty who know Lisa personally, and that, actually, of course, was the role she had when she was Shadow Minister for Children, and also has been, you know, Shadow Minister, you know, for Charity. And uh, you know, um, I, I, you know, I think Lisa is one of the most highly respected you know, politicians you know, in Parliament at the moment. Um, we know actually that um, there was even debate you know, a few years ago you know, when Owen Smith actually was there as almost a kind of you know, you know, a leadership challenge actually at that particular time that Lisa's name was mentioned. Um, my personal view is that actually in a few years' time down the line there will be far you know, less well qualified candidates to actually lead. You know, the Labour Party perhaps back into you know, a position of power. It's a real privilege to welcome you know, Lisa Nandy you know, and Martin of you. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Lisa here with us today. As you know, she has forgone the state opening of Parliament to be here because she said she'd had enough of institutional pantomime and therefore won't to come to university instead. <laughs> um, let's, let's begin, Lisa, because we've got about an hour together and want to have lots of time for questions from the floor as, as well. I want to start a little bit about the Lisa Nandy backstory, oh, as God. it were. 
Where did you come from? How did you become an MP? And this is worse than... I thought he was going to start with Brexit, and actually I'd rather do <laughs> Brexit, I think. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me, and thank you as well for such a lovely introduction, which has completely ruined everything now, because I can't possibly live up to it. Um, I think the uh, well, first thing to say about backstory is that uh, I am a bit troubled, if I'm really honest, by how much backstory and individual circumstance and personalities have come to dominate politics in the last few years. And I, I find it quite difficult to talk about my personal life it's you know personal but I also think that my own life is not that relevant because it's not only that I've had my own unique individual experiences but in Wigan I represent 75,000 people who've had very different experiences who deserve a voice too it's also that different people react differently to different circumstances and I think politics has to be capable of understanding that and accommodating it and the worst systems that I've had to deal with over the last decade as an MP have been those that don't understand that, particularly the benefit system, which doesn't realise that some people will thrive on adversity and other people will be knocked for six by it, and that you have to have systems that are capable of dealing with that. Having said all of that, I will do my best to stop being a politician and I will genuinely answer your question. Um, so I, I grew up in Manchester, I was born in Manchester in 1979, so the year that Margaret Thatcher came to power. Uh, I was 17 and a half before I saw my first Labour government and I often hope that my four-year-old won't have the same experience. Um, so I grew up in the 80s and, and 90s in Manchester. I moved to Bury when I was a teenager where my stepfamily lived and still live and my mum still lives. Um, and uh, I, it was a very political time. It was very, very difficult, I think, to grow up in that era in the north of England and not be politicised by it. Um, but I've also got a very political family too. My dad is a Marxist, as you may have guessed by the fact that he thinks I'm far too far to the right. Uh, he's still a Marxist in, in his 80s now and spent a career in uh, academia and in race relations, but, um, but, but now is a frequent observer and commentator on politics, largely to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, my mum, was um, she, she was a social worker who then went off and had some kids and then became went into TV. Uh, Granada TV was recruiting, so she got a job there and ended up being a current affairs producer, working on programmes like World in Action and so on before she retired. So a very political family in lots of different ways. And um, when, I, I, when I went to university, I went to Newcastle University. No offence to Edge Hill, but it was the best three years of my life. <laughs> Um, and after I graduated from university, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. If I'm totally honest, I still don't. And that's one of the things that I say to a lot of young people in Wigan is you don't, you know, if you, if you know what you want to do, don't have a dream, have a plan. If you don't know what you want to do, then work out an immediate plan, pick something, go and do it, do it well, and use it to open doors to other things. So I went off to work for um, a guy called Neil Gerrard, who was um, a, a, a Labour MP as his housing caseworker in Walthamstow and dealing with people who were street homeless all the way through to you know massive overcrowding, damp, all those sorts of problems at a time when the housing benefit system had collapsed in London and homelessness was massively on the increase. That led me into working for Centrepoint, Youth Homelessness Charity, and then uh, because most of the young people that we were working with at Centrepoint were refugees, I went off to the Children's Society to run our work with refugee and migrant children and it was that I suppose that led me into parliament because what I learned in uh, eight or nine years in the voluntary sector was that although we could do as much as we could for those young people and more often than not they were doing everything that they could to change the circumstances of their, their lives quite often those circumstances have been set by factors completely out of their control often determined before they were even born so for a lot of those young people, the biggest, most decisive factor in whether they would be OK or not was what had happened to their parents and the circumstances they'd been born into. In the end, I came to the realisation that that is about power and it's about who has power in this country and who doesn't and who gets to decide and the decisions that we make. And so that made me think I can't keep going around in circles trying to help a few when, for the majority, this is failing and only politics can change it. And so when... The Wigan seat came up. I was, um, uh, you know, a lot of my family in Bury and Lancashire were saying it's worth having a, 
a go. I mean, I, I'd never done anything like that before. I'd been a councillor, a Labour councillor, but I didn't think I could honestly win the nomination and win the election, but I thought it was worth, worth putting my name into the ring and you know, going through the process and seeing how it worked and seeing if I could learn something from the experience. And so I went and made the strongest pitch that I possibly could to party members. Um, and um, a few weeks later, I was the candidate. And uh, then about four weeks after that, I was elected to Parliament. Um, and it, I have to say that a lot of MPs, some MPs come in like that, you know, through a variety of circumstances. At short notice, other other candidates have planned it and they know what they're doing. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but it was quite a moment for me because I remember standing there on election night, having just been elected, and my it was about five o'clock in the morning. We have lots of smaller parties that stand in Wigan, so it takes a long time to count the votes. You often have recounts so that um, those smaller parties can see if they can keep their deposit. And so it had gone on for a long time, and most of them had gone home by the time the result had been declared. And so there were only about five or six of us left in the room. My mum was there, and my agent, the returning officer, and my Tory opponent, if I'm right. And I'm not sure there was anyone else left. And so it's not like the thing you see on telly with the sort of really, you know, knife-edge results coming in and TV cameras everywhere. It was just a few of us standing in a room. So I thanked Michael, who was my Tory opponent, and then he thanked me. Um, and then I was handed an envelope and we went home. And uh, I, op I sat on the sofa and looked at it and thought, this is to the Member of Parliament. And uh, my partner said to me, we better open it then. So I opened it and there was a letter which said, you are now the Member of Parliament for Wigan. Congratulations. Please come to the Portcullis House entrance of Parliament, the House of Commons, uh, between Monday and Thursday next week. And please, please bring a utility bill with you to prove <laughs> your identity. <laughs> I thought, that can't be it, can it? Surely you don't just turn up with a gas bill and they let you be the MP. But that is exactly what happens. I mean, I turned up with this, clutching this bill and waved it at the police officer who said, please come in. And that, that was it. And then you've got to find your feet. And like a lot of people said to me, it's not a job. Actually, it's a, it's a vocation, but it's also it's a platform. And if you use it right, you can use it as a megaphone for people in this country who have no voice at all and use that to change things for people. And that was probably one of the best bits of early advice I got, really. You say that Newcastle was the three best years of, oh, of, of your life. You'd be upset about that. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just going to ask for, for this audience, what did university do for you? Uh, I think confidence was a lot of it, actually. That, um, I, I went to I went to quite a few schools when I was younger, um, just various reasons, you know, moving house or having to move schools or uh, when my mum got remarried, I moved to Bury and so changed again. Um, and I never was never hugely unconfident, but I think one of the things that happened to me when I first went to Newcastle was that one of our tutors called us in and said, look, there's going to be thousands of young people graduating from red brick universities with a 2-1, which, you know, most of you, not all of you, but most of you, if you try hard enough, will get in similar subjects. And then you're going to have to go and get a job. And this was, you know, it's around the time, actually, 2001 is when I graduated, when there were a lot of jobs available. It wasn't as tough, anywhere near as tough as it is for young people now. But he just said, what, what's going to make you stand out? What's going to differentiate you? And I thought, at this present time, probably nothing, if I'm honest. So he said, go and do something. Go and do something with your three years. And um, so I went off and joined the student newspaper, The Courier. And I did that largely because I looked at student politics and thought I loathed everybody who was involved in it <laughs> and everything about it. And so I went off to, to join the student newspaper and... Uh, first thing I was asked to do was to ring up the vice chancellor and asked why he earned so much money at a time when the <laughs> university was making cuts, and we just went from there really. And it was, it forced me to step out of my sort of comfort zone, and it forced me to work as part of a team. And my God, if you think politics is cutthroat, student journalism is much much worse. <laughs> and so it just forced me to sort of confront some of the things that I would then have to go on and confront behaviours that I've have to deal with in Parliament and in other places. And uh, it was a bit of a game changer for me, really. And, uh, you know, it also, it does open up your world quite a lot. That having to, it, you know, the family that I come from is always one where we've had lots of different polit political traditions, lots of different debate, and the respect for differences of opinion and different 
political traditions and different types of argument. But I think what it forced me to do for the first time was actually make the argument properly myself. And it was only in the last year or so of university that I started to understand that that's what I was supposed to be doing and also to understand how difficult that was actually and that you have to take on your opponent's arguments at their strongest point, not just at their weakest point. And that if you really want to change the world, you have to bring people with you. And that probably has informed my politics a lot because although I came into Parliament in 2010, you know, billed as some left-wing firebrand who was going to shake up the Labour Party, I actually am much more about consensus and trying to build the widest possible consensus that you can across political parties as well as between political parties. Because in the end, I think that's the only way that you build lasting change for people who most need it. So really, you're just another journalist who became an MP. That's <laughs> I was a terrible <laughs> journalist, actually. I think if you, the editor of the student newspaper at the time was the guy who then went on to be um, the deputy political correspondent for, the, for B BBC Politics. And um, he always says to people that I was literally the worst person that I ever had on his student newspaper. <laughs> so it was probably a good decision to go into politics. I missed every deadline, for starters, and I gather that's not the done thing in print journalism where that means empty pages. Um, luckily in Parliament you can miss your deadlines as Brexit is proving. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'm sure now that he works in the daily politics he's met much worse journalists. But that's, 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 that's another question. Maybe let's, let's move on then to the B word um, and talk a little bit about where we are at the moment and in particular where you are at the moment as a, a representative for, for Wigan. Uh, so I think we're in a very bad place as a country and I think that is true whether you voted leave or remain, whether you've changed your mind or you haven't, whether you're sick to death of hearing about this or whether you are awake at three o'clock in the morning like a lot of people in my constituency trying to work out how to solve this. I think that um, what's happened in the last few years is that we've lost the ability to have constructive debate, respectful debate, we've lost the ability to understand one another Brexit has become a culture war, I think, in a similar way to uh, an issue like climate change in Australia, where, you know, in Australia they've got a, a huge imperative around climate change. You know, many of the smaller islands around Australia are at the sharp end of those extreme weather events. This is literally life and death for a lot of people. Uh, and you've got a very, very strong movement, particularly in the big urban centres, where you've got a younger... Um, population that tend to have have had access to higher education and so on uh, who are who have white collar jobs who are very very concerned mm -hmm. rightly about climate change but then outside of those places you've got a lot of people who haven't had access to those uh, educational opportunities who haven't got access to those better paid jobs who are heavily reliant on the fossil fuel industries to survive not just them but their entire communities who are saying, well, hang on a minute, if you close down our communities, what is left for us? And it's an argument that has become almost a culture war. And I think Brexit has done something very, very similar to Britain here. So if you look at what's happened over the last, uh, what happened with the referendum, uh, it, it exposed a number of things. It exposed, first of all, that there is a huge and growing, long-standing and growing divide between uh, the big urban centres in Britain, the major cities, and outside. So almost everywhere in the country, wherever you look, people, the populations in Manchester, Birmingham, uh, uh, London, Glasgow voted overwhelmingly to remain, but only a few short miles away from all of those places. Um, in you know, play, my, my own area is a good example of this. Manchester voted overwhelmingly to remain. Bury, Bolton, Oldham, just a few miles down the road, voted in similarly large numbers to leave. And this is what my friend Will Jennings, who's an academic at Southampton University, calls two Englands. It's two Englands that have been moving apart for some time on almost every social attitude measure. It's not just about Brexit. It's about attitudes to human rights, to immigration, to LGBT rights, uh, and to the future as to whether the future looks optimistic or pessimistic and um, this is a this is an aging story this is about 40 years of industry moving out of our towns in and uh, investment going into cities and young people taking opportunities that have been opened up to them around higher education leaving those towns and rural areas going to the cities and finding increasingly when they look back there's nothing to return home to and as a consequence we've become a very divided nation 
What Brexit has done is expose that. It isn't the cause of that, but it has put rocket fuel under it. And my party is in a particularly difficult position around this, I think, because we represent some of the most heavily leave and heavily remain areas of the country. That is the historic coalition that Labour's always relied on to govern. Whether we can speak for both, I mean, I think you've seen over the last three years the various contortions that Labour's gone through around Brexit is a consequence of us trying to speak for both. But there is a very real possibility in the next few weeks that we will abandon the opportunity, the, the fight to speak for both, and that we will pick a side. And I think that would be a tragedy for the country because the path that the Liberal Democrats, some of whom, including Joe, I really respect, but the path that they've taken troubles me as much as it troubles Liberal Democrats like Norman Lamb. When they say bollocks to Brexit, they're essentially saying bollocks to half the country, and that is how it is heard and felt in towns like mine very strongly. Um, and, uh, the, you know, on, you, on the other hand, you've got the Tories who, after Theresa May did what was, I think, a really important speech when she took office, saying uh, that she was going to govern in the interests of the many, um, completely abandoned that strategy after the 2017 election and essentially, uh, how do I put this, I can't really put it any more politely, than stuck two fingers up at everyone who voted Remain in this country. And, you know, although I appreciate that there'll be a lot of people in this country who are pretty frustrated with Labour's position, I have been generally quite supportive of where Jeremy Corbyn's been on this because he put it as r the best way I've heard so far from a leading politician in this debate that you can no more wish away the votes of the 17.5 million who voted leave than the 16 million who voted remain and nor should we. We should seek to govern in the interests of both. Now that doesn't necessarily lead you to a half-half position on Brexit, that could take you to any variety of places on Brexit. But what's important is that you try to understand what lay behind the Remain and the Leave votes on both sides and that you try and find a way of bringing those two halves of the country back together. And that is what I and a number of colleagues on both the Leave and Remain sides, I I constituencies in Labour have been trying to do. So if you look at some of the things that Alison McGovern, for example, who's the MP for the Wirral, has been saying, although she's in favour of a second referendum and I'm not, we're trying very, very hard to hold on to that sense that there is a political party that is capable of speaking for the majority in this country and, and healing those divisions. Whether we succeed or not is genuinely really up in the air at the moment, but it seems to me that this is a really, really fundamental and important thing to do. So um, take, it from, take, take it from that. You are backing the motion that was passed at conference recently about... After, after a Labour election victory, negotiate a new deal, put that to put that to the people in a confirmatory referendum. So I'm opposed to a second referendum, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I was opposed to the first one. I was one of only a handful of Labour MPs who broke the whip and refused to vote for it in the first place uh, because I thought it would turn into a complete mess. I didn't see it going this far. I don't think anyone can claim to have predicted that but I thought that what it, it would do a number of things it would divide people needlessly I think for most of my constituents actually although I think for most people in Wigan still their heart says I don't want to be in the European Union and it will continue to feel that way I think for most people Europe a wasn't the key issue that mattered to them so it's elevated something that was a secondary issue for a lot of people to become the primary issue facing the country but secondly that during the six months in the run-up to the referendum, I spent lots of time in Redcar and Sunderland and Wigan and Bolton and places that have voted Labour for 100 years, but who, where people were largely on a different side from the Labour Party on the referendum. And what I heard from most people, leave and remain, is that it was genuinely a finely ba balanced decision in which people had a mixture of views. I do. I don't like the way that Greece was treated by the European Union, but I think that we're better off in the European Union cooperating and trying to change it. I think, by the way, that reforming the EU, which a lot of my colleagues say, you know, stay and remain and reform, I think at the moment there isn't really a path to doing that, if I'm honest, and that's one of the reasons that I'm sceptical about a second referendum, because <coughs> if that's going to be the message in the second referendum, I don't see any different outcome. I don't see any prospect that the debate has got better in the last few years. In fact, I think it's got worse. I have to say that taking part in that referendum with the lies that were told on all sides and the anger that was displayed and the targeting of minorities, I think this will get worse 
not better. And even in Wigan, we saw a huge spike in hate crime just after the referendum result came in. I think that, you know, to quote Damien Green, I think it would be divisive rather than decisive. I think if you leave Remain off, uh, if you leave No Deal off the ballot paper, it would com be completely and utterly illegitimate to a lot of people in this country. So the idea that it would settle matters, you know, I just think I, I think this is a fantasy. If I'm really honest, um, so I don't actually support that very convoluted motion, although I su support the sentiment of trying to find a way to hold the party together and speak for both. Um, to be really honest with you, and this is a bit controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway, I don't think it matters that much what Labour says now, because I think after three years of various members of the Shadow Cabinet out arguing loudly two completely contradictory positions, I think very few people are listening to us. I think very few people are listening to the Tories either. And I think what matters much more than what Labour says now is what we do. And that is, you know, essentially to resolve this, we either vote for a deal... Um, whether that's Boris Johnson's deal, which would not be my preference, or where I don't actually think Boris Johnson has a deal, by the way, I think this is pre-election posturing, but whether we try to bring the withdrawal agreement bill, which came out of the cross-party talks before the House, and uh, see if we can find a cross-party majority for that. We never got a chance to vote on that, because Theresa May resigned, but that would have been something that I would have voted for, and that a lot of Tory MPs like Philip Hammond and Amber Rudd would have voted for and a few Liberal Democrat backbenchers as well. So it's possible you could find a majority for that. That would be my preference. Or we trigger a general election. For obvious reasons, we don't want to do that in the next couple of weeks, while no deal Brexit is still a threat. But that is becoming more and more pressing. Uh, or do we, or we do, do we try and form a majority in the House for a second referendum? Well, for all the reasons that I've said to you, that's not my preference, although I did abstain on it. Um, I voted against it a number of times, but I abstained on it when we had the indicative votes because I just thought if you're serious about stopping no deal Brexit, then you've got to be prepared to allow all options that are not no deal to go through. Um, unfortunately, colleagues who are in favour of a second referendum in the Labour Party didn't take the same approach and that's why a customs union and the single, single market access was defeated and that is why we are where we are now. But uh, that, that sentiment of compromise, I think, has got to be what guides us over the next few weeks. I'm fed up of hearing arguments between Labour, Lib Dem, SNP politicians about who leads a government of national unity. The truth is that if we wanted to stop no deal and we wanted to try and resolve this, we could work together to do that now if we were prepared to compromise. It's just that so far, people have got their entrenched positions. They're not prepared to move out of them, and that is why the country is moving towards what is going to be a crisis in two weeks' time. <laughs> I don't know if that helps at all. Oh, sorry, shall I tell some jokes? We'll go to the song at the end. <laughs> um, just to pick up on, on some of that is to say that uh, the topic of the, the festival in the next couple of weeks is about exchanges and how we communicate ideas uh, with, with, with one another. But Brexit seems to, as you were saying, change that in some way. It's fundamentally made it difficult in the public realm to... to have 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 arguments with people without them turning into to uh, a culture. I want to speak a little bit about your experience of that and how you how you're handling that, that as a as a Labour MP in a Northern constituency at this moment. Um, it's quite difficult, if I'm honest. It's quite a challenge. So, uh, I think the last few years in politics has been uh, has been difficult for a number of reasons. W one part of this is because. Um, of some of the developments we've seen over social media. I think that ha that has been enormously positive in many ways. You know, it, will it can enable people to speak directly to me, for me to hear them. Uh, when it f when so I, I was elected in 2010, and in 2010, most MPs weren't on Twitter. Facebook was a thing, but it wasn't used very much by politicians. It tended to be something that was just about sort of, well, I was a lot younger then, and it was about sort of keeping up with your mates and social plans and people posting pictures of their kids, which is still... Yeah, a lot how it's used but it's become much more widely used since then social media and so just to give you an idea uh, just today I've probably had about my predecessor Neil Turner didn't have his own email address uh, this morning I've probably had about 300 emails from people in Wigan that some of which demand an absolutely urgent response some of which can wait but can't wait that long um, plus uh, lots and lots of people tweeting at me on Twitter and posts on Facebook and so on. So it's become, 
politicians have become more accessible and in a way that's good. It means we can speak directly to our constituents as well through different mediums rather than having to go through a media that may or not be hostile, may or not be straight. You know, some of these things have been really enormously helpful, but on the whole, I think the turn that that has taken in politics has been really, really difficult because I can't hear mm. what constituents are saying to me now over social media because of the clamour of noise. When you get thousands of people tweeting at you, or posting messages on Facebook, it's very, very difficult to distinguish between, you know, the person who might have sent you a message saying, I want you to go to a breast cancer debate because a, because a mum died a few weeks earlier and it really, really matters. And there's something really important that's happening in Wigan with breast screening services being moved and so on. But, and that and a Russian bot that is just there to try and knock you off your stride and cause you trouble. And there is no way really of filtering between those things. So it becomes really difficult. The sheer volume of abuse is very difficult to cope with. Um, so I'll just say to you now that those people, there are deliberate strategies to, try to target MPs to try and stop us from, you know, to try and make us feel that the world is against us. Most MPs now don't do their own social media. So some of the most uh, prolific people on social media, the highest profile people, you'll be surprised that now they don't even have access to their own accounts. They have other people who do it for them. doesn't mean it doesn't reflect what they really think, but they'll... You know, one MP was saying to me the other day that he plays around with his team, they'll work out what they want to post, and then somebody will post it for him. But he can't ever see the responses that come back, because if you do, you would just lose it pretty quickly. So that the barriers have gone up, and I think that is a really sad thing. Um, and I also think what's happening on social media, it normalises that sort of level of debate, and uh, it's become really difficult. Now, MPs, of course, can shut that down, but other people can't, so I have a lot of constituents now. Um, who say to me that they can't even be on social media because they can't cope with it. Because people who are, you know, they might know from down the local pub who are quite friendly will post some awful things about them and their families. And so the debate that's happening out there in the country, I think, is starting to break down as well. And it's really starting to affect people's emotional well-being and their willingness to engage in politics. And that is something that worries me really, really deeply. And I think that is quite new. I think that's something that's only emerged over the last few weeks. When I first became the MP for Wigan in 2010, I used to go into local schools and say to young people, you should be thinking about this. You know, whether you, well, however you want to participate in politics, whether it's working for a pressure group or a charity, whether you want to, uh, you know, get onto the local council, whether you want to become a member of parliament, whether you want to be prime minister, whether you just want to sign petitions or whether you don't at all. But think about it, because this should be an avenue for you. And I would love to see some of you, particularly the girls in parliament in the future, I really hesitate to say that now because I know what I'm letting them in for and I, I wonder particularly saying to young women come into politics whether it's actually responsible to encourage them to do it knowing everything that is meant for me, my friends, one of my friends was Joe Cox, my family, their families, I do hesitate. I don't know what the answer is to any of this. The only thing that I've been able to do over the last few years is try and I haven't always succeeded but to conduct myself better than that. I don't scream at my colleagues in private. I don't question their motives in public. I'll try to take them on at the, the, about the strength of the argument rather than the individual who's speaking. And I do that with people of all political parties, including my own. And I, I just hope somehow that that sets a better tone and gives people some sense of hope that we can do better than this. Because you know, a few weeks ago, Nikki Morgan and I were going to do a conference together just over the road from Parliament at the QE2 Centre. And it was on a day when there was a big, demo about Brexit outside and there was an effigy of Sadiq Khan being dragged around the streets and Theresa May being hung by the neck and you could hear the roar of noise from inside Parliament and we walked out of the gates and there was a lot of there were a lot of very angry people and there were people who'd surrounded us screaming traitor at us we walked down the road to this conference and on the way back the mood had got a lot uglier and a group of men surrounded us and tried to block us from going into Parliament one of them tried to punch Nikki in the face and they were shouting traitor around us. And we got through the gates and we got into Parliament. We did manage to get to the vote, but there was, um, there was a, a, a moment there where I sort of reflected on why people feel it's legitimate to be doing that sort of thing outside of Parliament. And I've spent three years standing in Parliament with people screaming traitor at each other across different sides of the House of Commons chamber. And it seems to me no wonder then that people are screaming it back at us. Um, when we go outside. We've got to set a better tone, I suppose, is the only way that I can think to resolve this. 
if politicians could set a better tone, perhaps people outside would would follow suit. So Rebecca Vardy is not the only one who doesn't have <laughs> access to her own <laughs> social media Allegedly. accounts. Allegedly. Allegedly. You'd have to ask Colleen <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that, Lisa. We've got time for questions from the audience. I want to get some student questions and people involved. Just can you wait till the microphone comes because we want to pick that up, pick it up for the recording. Um, I, I was I, I was elected in in May um, uh, as a Labour councillor in South Ribble, Great. Uh, one of the few areas that, that we did quite well in uh, in, in May. Um, I, I was wondering if, sort of generally speaking, you had any advice to younger people who are entering elected office for the first time and sort of dealing with the amount of upset and anger that there is at the moment. It, it, just for sort of younger people in general. <coughs> Gosh, well, well, first of all, congratulations. And thank you for, I mean, you know, I'd say this whichever political party, obviously it's mine, so I'm really pleased. But I, it's just great to see people stepping up at the moment. And, like, if I'm honest, if I went back to being sort of younger, I'm not sure that looking at politics as it is now, I would. So, I, you know, thank you for what you're doing. It's the only way it's going to get better. I suppose in terms of advice, I don't have huge amounts of advice to offer, to be honest. I learn a lot from younger people because I think... The younger generation is more adept at dealing with these changed circumstances, uh, possibly, than we are. But um, I would just say build alliances. Build the strongest alliances that you can because it sustains you and it keeps you going. Um, so when I first got elected in 2010, um, a lot of my... I came in at a very big intake of uh, MPs because there'd been the MPs' expenses scandal and... So lots of people had stood down, and so there were loads of us who were elected newly for the first time. And there was a lot of talent in that generation as well. And so very early on, most of my colleagues were put onto the Labour front bench, and I wasn't. And um, uh, there was actually, there is a joke that goes around Parliament. It is true, actually, that a guy who died was put onto the front bench, and I wasn't. <laughs> But then they found out he died and they decided not to fill the post. Anyway, I didn't. I had a bit of a mixed relationship with Ed Miliband, if I'm honest. And uh, that continued throughout the time when, we were, when, when he was leader. But uh, Tessa Jowell rang me, and it was a bit of a surprise. Tessa Jowell traditionally thought of as being on the sort of Blairite right of the party. Me, having come in, been very much seen as on the left of the party. And Tessa rang me and said, would you like to be my PPS? And I was a bit surprised, but I thought, well, yeah, I mean, she's rung me. That's great. Thank you. So I went and worked with her on the Olympics for a few years, and I learnt a lot from that woman. Um, not least that you treat people with kindness and courtesy, and it will come back to you in droves. Uh, so she's always separated out the political arguments that she has with politicians from the personal. And personally, she's decent, she's respectful, even when she's, she was very, very angry with what they were doing. She would find a way to hold that in check and, ha and make the case and try and win the argument. Build those big alliances. It's the only way you ever get change done. There are times when you absolutely just have to stick up for your principles, stick up for your values. It can be very, very lonely. You do it anyway, but people will respect you for it. Um, and you've just got to keep going and try. Politics goes in zigzags, not straight lines for most people. Uh, God knows at the moment that is certainly true. Uh, you know, Michael Heseltine famously s sort of had a plan to be Prime Minister that he blocked out year by year until he was 40. I think for most people that, that doesn't happen, and moreover, it probably shouldn't. You know, in the end, you've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror when all this is over and feel that you did the right thing and that you can live with the decisions that you made. Um, and so uh, stick to your principles. Just, you know, if it doesn't feel right in your gut, there's probably a reason why. And that can take you into quite a lonely place. But keep going, build the alliances, you know, work with whoever you can to make change. Uh, have the stamina, don't let it get you down. Um, and uh, I suppose the only other thing that I would say is that um, is the, the long game, right? So in the end, if you are genuinely trying to make big change, whether it's in your community or in your country, in your university, then um, it may not come overnight, it probably won't, and I bet you know this already, but it will come in the end because if you win the argument, the pressure from outside is too big. So spend time outside of that bubble. Don't spend time in your Labour group. Spend time with the people that you represent. 
Um, because if I've learned anything in 10 years in Parliament, it's that the clamour for change has to come out from outside. It won't come from the inside. And you need good people on the inside who are capable of grabbing hold of that and running with it and making it happen. But that's where it comes from. So spend your time outside with the people that you represent. And that, that, that is how you'll build change in the end. Another question. Got a couple over there. Good. <coughs> yeah, take, take the one in the back first and then we'll then there's one at the front. Rose, make it fine, where you were. Thank you. Um, so my question is mainly just about the language that's used by politicians now. So when the EU referendum came about and Leave won the referendum, Leave voters were happy. They, yeah. want, they knew they won. They had no need to start going on about traitors or anything like that. Yeah. When all the tension came about, it was because you had MPs like Anna Subra and Diane Abbott go on in, in uh, interviews or you know, in the public saying how Brexit supporters are racist, uneducated, Nazis, bigots. They were saying people who voted for the Brexit party are racist, bigots. Same with UKIP. I mean, you was on Sky News in March 2000, uh, this year, yeah. and you was talking about previously election results in Wigan, and you said how UKIP are a racist and far-right party. Yeah. So it's a language like that that encourages Brexiteers who've seen their vote just get wasted yeah. and going down where Labour's changing the policy on Brexit every week, that it's making them, them angry, making the rhetoric become a bit more aggressive, but yes. it starts with the Remainers. Right. So do you not think because of how much you pay, your senior position like in the country, being an MP, being in Parliament, and do you not think that all politicians should have a bit more professionalism about themselves? Yeah, so obviously a fan then. Okay, well, let, um, l okay, let me try and start with the, the thing about where I disagree with you. Where I really disagree with you is that you obviously don't think that UKIP are a far right or a racist party. I do. I think the evidence is overwhelming about that. That doesn't mean that everybody who voted UKIP is far right or racist, but the way that UKIP behaved during that referendum campaign, um, the posters that came out, the language that came out, the language that's been directed at me by supporters, um, by representatives of that party, this is the far right in a different guise. Now, I think Nigel Farage is an incredibly, um, I think he's an incredibly gifted politician in that he took a decision very, very early on that if UKIP was going to become a mass political party, then it needed to uh, shed some of that language and that behaviour in order to present an acceptable face to the public. Um, and while he was leader, although locally and regionally that wasn't always the case for UKIP, at a national level they did manage to present that sort of uh, more mainstream acceptable face. That has completely collapsed in the last few years. And now you've got a leader of, the, of UKIP who is indistinguishable from far-right parties, who is appointing people who are openly racist as his political advisers, um, and who is doing enormous damage to this country, particularly to minorities, but actually to all of us. So I completely disagree with you about UKIP. I don't think that's irresponsible. In fact, I think it's the only responsible thing to do as an elected representative is to point out that that's happening, especially because I represent people in Wigan who are dealing with hate crime on a daily basis and deserve better than me pretending that that is not happening. But where I do agree with you is around the care that you use in the language. And when I say that UKIP are an openly racist and far-right party, I don't do so lightly. And I don't talk about extremism lightly. And I don't talk about the very real threat to liberal democracy at the moment lightly because I don't think that that is helpful to over-exaggerate what is happening. So when I say that I think that liberal democracy is genuinely under attack from parties like UKIP, who do not believe in representative democracy, who do not believe in uh, all of those institutions that safeguard minority rights in this country and have one by one systematically gone after them in order to attack them over recent years. When I say that we've got a real problem in this country, I mean it, and I wouldn't say so lightly. Where I don't think that uh, those people who believe in liberal democracy, those people who believe in minority rights, those people who 
believe that the system has to work have done themselves any favours is by a failing to acknowledge that the system isn't working. I mean, how could it possibly be that three years ago we had a referendum that where a majority of people who turned out to vote voted leave that was not seen coming by almost every political representative and uh, journalist, political journalist in this country. I mean, that tells you that representative democracy has become very unmoored from the people that we represent. And where you see such problems with institutions like Parliament that it's far too easy for those opponents of liberal democracy to come after it, to discredit it, not just Parliament, but the judiciary, the civil service, all uh, the, the, the media, all of these institutions that traditionally have played a really, really important role in the checks and balances on power in this country and the safeguarding of minority rights. These institutions are not working properly and we have to acknowledge it and we have to start reforming them and changing them. And secondly, in this casual writing off of half of the country, which I sort of alluded to earlier. So you mentioned Diane Abbott. I was actually very uh, critical of Diane for the language that she used in an interview just after the referendum. It was the day after the referendum where it was suggested that the vote to leave was a racist vote and a xenophobic vote. Now, I can completely understand, uh, you know, someone who has is targeted more for racist abuse than any other single individual in British politics, why Diane felt very, very strongly about that. But the truth is that I have friends who voted leave and I have friends who voted remain, and they did so for very, very different reasons from each other and, and, and other people who voted the same way as them. But they are decent people who deserve a stake in the future of this country, and we have to find a way of bringing that back together. And you don't do it by calling Remainers liberal elitists, and you don't do it by calling people who voted leave too stupid to understand the question or too racist to care. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, I haven't fallen out with a lot of colleagues, but I've challenged a lot of colleagues and why relations have become very strained over recent years. And, you know, quite often the thing that's thrown back at me about that is that, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? You represent a leave constituency. But no, I wouldn't say that. I would because I represent a, a constituency where two-thirds of people voted leave. I say that because I spent a lot of time in the run-up to the referendum with people debating these issues out, and people voted for lots of different reasons. Let me just give you an example, and then I'll we'll take the next one. But One example of that is that uh, David Lammy came to Wigan recently. He's a friend of mine, and he is um, probably Remainer-in-chief, I think, in terms of fighting the fight for a second referendum. Um, but we've remained friends throughout this time, despite the fact that sometimes, you know, I've had issues with his language and he's had issues with my positions. Um, and he came to Wigan because he's looking at how you might start to put the country back together, which I think is really welcome. And he came and met quite a few of my constituents, uh, came down to one of the community centres and just had a general conversation with people. What he wanted to understand is how could it be that Tottenham which has consistently over many decades come out and supported Labour, where Labour values are very palpable, and Wigan, which is the same. How could people there who are, have been battered by 10 years of austerity, having very similar challenges in their lives, have come to completely different conclusions about whether the EU is part of the solution or part of the problem? And it was a really rich discussion. He was made very, very welcome. We didn't meet, hadn't orchestrated it, but we didn't meet a single person who'd voted to remain apart from me. But what he did meet was people who had completely different reasons for having wanted to leave. So there was one uh, person who said that, you know, when people like me had turned up and said, look, you know, things will get worse if we don't, if we, if we leave the EU and the EU has generally been good for us. She said, I looked at my estate and I just didn't agree. Um, there were other... Um, there were other people um, who, uh, one, one man said he didn't like the way that Greece had been treated and he thought that uh, he'd been originally in favour, but over the years he felt it had become a capitalist club. And there was every sort of view in between. And I think David went away with a very strong sense that this was quite a rich discussion, quite a nuanced discussion, and a far better discussion than the discussion we've been able to reflect in Parliament. And I went away feeling like we've got to do much better. There are people who voted Remain who have reservations about the EU. Let's start acknowledging the complexity again. Politics is never in black and white. It's always in shades of grey, and we ought to do better to reflect that. Thank you, Lisa. One la we've got time for one last question at the front. Well, it's down the front now, next to the camera. 
Uh, thanks very much. Lisa, I'm sorry, it's another, it's another Brexit uh, question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a GP in uh, a very poor area of Liverpool. Um, and I see the health problems you know, in my surgery. I see them when I drive around. Basically related to job, job insecurity, a lot of them. Uh, family breakdown. Um, dependency issues. Um, things where, where projects are, are funded on a short-term basis and needed to try and uh, deal with very difficult problems. And so my question is, is what do you think any form of Brexit is going to do for those people? Okay, so um, let me try and get to the sort of heart of the question because during the run-up to the referendum, the case that the Remain side were making struck me as largely about economics and largely about you know the briefing sheets that I was being sent by Remain campaigns, whether it was the Labour one or the sort of stronger in, were about going to try and convince people that the EU had been good for our economic well-being and uh, therefore that they should vote Remain. The argument I saw being made by the Leave side was very much um, that um, we're not part of Europe, we don't feel European, that this doesn't seem right, this doesn't sit right. And it was described and, and that patriotically we could do better as a nation standing by ourselves, being strong, being independent. It was a heart versus head sort of argument. And there were a lot of people, there was one woman I'll never forget on the last day of the referendum who came up to me in Wigan and was asking me questions about the NHS pledge. And she knew it was nonsense. I think most people did, to be honest. They knew that it was rubbish. But she said, to be honest, love, I don't really believe anybody anymore. So I think I'll just go with my heart. And heart was leave. And heart was always leave in all the places that I was campaigning in the six months up to the referendum. Now, I don't see any prospect that that's changed, right? So if you want to stop Brexit now, having had a referendum, in all honesty, I think the only way that you can do it is to do what the Lib Dems have done and just say revoke. And I think the consequences for this country of that are really, really profound. Because you can't, you can't make the argument that this is about democracy if there is only one result that you'll accept. And that is essentially what most advocates of the second referendum in Parliament are doing. When I asked an SNP colleague the other day on Politics Live, if the result goes against you again, will you accept it? He said, of course we won't, because it will make Scotland poorer. So there is a principled argument to be had, which says we are prepared to do democratic harm in order to get economic benefit. But that is the trade-off. We are now in a situation as a country where not to, um, to ignore the outcome of the referendum would be to do enormous and, in my view, long-lasting democratic harm. There is no question in my mind, though, that whichever path you take with a Brexit deal or no deal will have economic consequences. Now, I think there is a way through this. Um, uh, the deal, the, 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 the prospect of a close economic relationship with the EU, where we have access to a customs union and the single market, um, which does mitigate our sovereignty and our soft power, but enables you to leave the European Union with some kind of deal that will protect those people that you work with day in, day out in Liverpool and will protect jobs in constituencies like mine and will perhaps then enable us to have a much more nuanced, much better, well-informed debate about where we go next as a country, whether we come all the way out and we cut all ties with the European Union altogether or whether in future generations people want to go in. But I don't see any prospect of a future for this country, if I'm really honest, that doesn't result in serious, serious harm unless we start to compromise and agree a deal. Now, I appreciate that that is not shared by a lot of people for very good reasons. And you know, I respect that because there are arguments against my position, just as there are arguments for it. One of the strongest arguments against my position is that we haven't, after three years, started negotiating a trade deal. So once we pass a withdrawal agreement, we have to then go into those negotiations and that will take years to conclude. That is, that is undeniable. What is also undeniable is that if we leave with no deal, we then have to negotiate ongoing arrangements with the EU. And it's much, much more difficult to do it at that stage because you have to get all 27 member states and their parliaments to agree and vote for that, those arrangements. 
it gives any single country a power of veto over those, and that's things like medicines, clinical trials, organ donation schemes, and so on. Um, and a second referendum, to me, doesn't resolve this issue, it just prolongs it. So uh, I think the real choices that you're facing right now are whether we negotiate a deal or whether you revoke. And, you know, that, how you feel about that, obviously you're all well informed here, it's up to you, but I feel very strongly that the consequences for this entire country would be really, really serious of revoking. So, you know, I, I'm sorry because I, I feel like there ought to be, you know, in this age of sort of conviction politics and rallies and, you know, everything's got to be either right or wrong, good or evil, I feel that people often expect a politician to turn up and say there is one right way and it's my way and that is the end. But what I'm telling you is we've reached a stage as a country through a series of bad decisions uh, that have left us with no good options, only difficult ones, and I think we've got to start compromising and making the best of them. Sorry, we're, sorry I'm going I'm to have to, I'm gonna have to just, just stop there because like, uh, like C Cinderella, when the clock strikes one, Lisa must be elsewhere doing the good work of democracy. I'd just like to, to thank her for sharing her time with us uh, this afternoon and giving us a sense of the complexity of the issue and the shades of grey uh, in, public, in being a, a, an MP and a public representative at this, very, this challenging, challenging moment. I'd just like to thank you very much, Lisa, for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <clears throat>